choices, let, like let everything through, or uh, essentially drop everything. But of course, uh, it's not possible to go with, uh, with them. So what we did, uh, we submitted this proposal. This one was accepted by uh, six-man working group too, which essentially forbids the use of fragmentation for neighbor discovery traffic. Which means that now for neighbor discovery, address, conf um, uh, address configuration, Slack, and so on, you cannot have fragmentation there. So that, uh, even when that's a very small change, if you want, it means that now you cannot have the packets split into multiple fragments, and that means that it's easy to, for example, not just block uh, those packets at the layer 2 device, such as a switch, but it's also easy to monitor neighbor discovery traffic in the same way that we used to do that with, with R. This one was adopted by the six-man working group uh, like a week or two weeks ago. And the idea of what I would expect is to have this one published as an RFC this year. Uh, this one, well, we have talked about this one quite a lot. Uh, essentially, router advertisement guard was something very similar to DHCP snooping. So the idea is that in IPv6, um, auto configuration is usually done with uh, some ICMP version 6 messages that are called router advertisements, okay, or the or RA. And uh, router advertisement guard is about filtering those router advertisements at the layer 2 device. So essentially, if you have a switch with, let's say, eight ports, I can tell the device, okay, I only want to allow router advertisements on this particular port. And uh, if the device receives a router advertisement on any other port, it will filter those packets. The problem was that this uh, te technology or mechanism, if you want, was uh, standardized a couple of years ago. It was actually implemented in Cisco devices, but it's trivial to evade. Essentially, you can include extension headers, or you can fragment your router advertisement, and you can evade uh, router advertisement guard, at least as implemented by, by Cisco. We submitted uh, some document, which is here, OK? which essentially contains a discussion of how to evade the current implementations of router advertisement guard and provides uh, advice on how to implement it. And the idea is that with this, uh, co with this uh, specification in mind, if you now implement router advertisement guard, it's not uh, easy to actually evade. This one has been around for kind of like a long time, and this one is in the final stage uh, for publication as an RFC. Uh, Final words about uh, IPv6 firewalling. One of the main problems that you have with um, firewalling in IPv6 is that, for example, if you want to do stateless firewalling, stateless being that you are not going, for example, to reassemble, to reassemble uh, IPv6 fragments, so you are going to do stateless firewalling, uh, you could be in situations such as this, similar to what I mentioned before. So let's say that I'm an attacker and I want to, uh, let's say, circumvent your IPv6 uh, firewall. So this is my original packet, the one that I wanted to send. So now what I do is I fragment this original packet and I come up with these two fragments, okay? So now if your device, your stateless firewall, receives this first fragment, you cannot really tell what's inside this packet. You cannot even tell whether it's a TCP segment or whatever is in that packet. Now if you receive the second fragment, this one, same thing. You cannot tell whether what's inside is a TCP segment and so on. This essentially means that um, it's impossible to do stateless firewalling with uh, IPv6, at least with the current uh, specifications. So uh, we came up with this uh, proposal. This one was also accepted by the six-man working group. And essentially what this proposal is about is to require that the entire IPv6 header chain is present in the first fragment. So if I go back one slide, the idea is that if you fragment this packet, you need to have all of this and the TCP header in the first fragment. So now if you have, let's say, a stateless firewall that receives uh, the first fragment of a packet, it can either look at the whole header chain and tell, for example, whether that's a TCP segment, ICMP, or whatever, and it, if it finds that the whole uh, or the entire IPvC header chain is missing, then it's safe to actually drop that fragment. So simple proposal, but it allows for stateless firewalling, which is a good thing. Uh, there's also an, an insanely large amount to do with IPv6 firewalling, starting from what an IPv6 firewall is. So if you talk, for example, with firewall vendors, many of them claim that they do IPv6 firewalling, and then when you ask what's the support that they have, it's like, well, 
Uh, they don't know, okay? Uh, I also know of uh, telcos that are, were willing to actually buy IPv6 firewalls, and uh, it was hard for them because uh, there was no, the, for example, there's currently no, no set of requirements as to what an IPv6 firewall is supposed to be able to do. So uh, there's a lot of work to do in this area. So this is just what we did with this oversized header chain or those split packets. It's just like a, like a very, very small piece of all the work that needs to be done. Uh, last topic is the mitigation of some denial of service attacks. Uh, this one is very simple. Uh, in IPv4, you may recall the smart ADAX, which was essentially about sending, for example, a ping packet to a, a broadcast address, a network directed broadcast address. And the idea was that if you spoof the source address, all of the systems in the amplifying network would respond and would essentially uh, perform a denial of service attack, would overload the victim system. IPv6 was supposed to remove all of that from the specifications, so in theory it wasn't possible to do smart attacks with IPv6, but we found that there are, others, uh, there are IPv6 options of this type, this type meaning that, well, they had to start with one zero and then you can put whatever you want here, and if you, uh, let's say if you forge any IPv6 option of this type, these options require all the systems that receive this packet to respond. For example, you could send a packet to a multicast address and all the systems that receive the, a packet containing this option will, resp will respond to the source address of, of, uh, of the spoof packet. Um, we actually discussed this one like about a year ago at the, at the IETF. Uh, there were not that many comments from the, from the working group. Uh, probably the only ones that I recall receiving, they essentially claimed that multicast was not really used at all. And uh, a couple a months or two months ago or so, I was meeting with um, some network operators that were saying that they were using multicast, not B6 multicast, but before multicast for IP uh, TV. And they wanted to, of course, use uh, IPv6 multicast for the same thing. So if you are running a multicast network, then you should be concerned about this stuff. Uh, it's, so far, it's just an individual proposal. So the relevant working group has not decided anything on this, whether to adopt it or, or not. Tools. Uh, well, for ages, the only set of tools that uh, there were about um, for IPv6 hacking, security, or whatever you want to call them, are THCs. I think that the work that these guys did, Mark Oste and others, uh, was very, very important. I think that uh, it's like essential for a technology to improve from a security standpoint. You have tools to access those, uh, the relevant implementations. So these guys produced tools like seven, eight years ago. I don't know how many, but a long time ago. Uh, we produced like a brand new set of tools. Actually, it doesn't really have a name. It's just like PV6 Toolkit, but <laughs> I wanted to, I, I needed to use a name for them. Um, the funny part of this is that, uh, in theory, they were not disclosed. And then I was doing a training one day, and a guy tells me, well, but your tools are publicly available. I said, yeah, they are not. They are, they are not, they are, they are not. <laughs> <laughs> the guy actually gave me a URL where they were published. So uh, what can I say? <laughs> uh, probably the bottom line is that at the point in which uh, something is sent to, let's say, more than 10 people, it's actually hard to control whether what, what happens with the tool. But the thing was that we didn't actually disclose the tool, but one of the, let's say, vendors, if you want, that received the tools to actually assess their own stuff, not to, uh, let's say, to post them on the internet, well, they decided otherwise, apparently. And, um, well, the tools are now online. I didn't include a link. Uh, I need to update this. Uh, but uh, so far, it's funny because uh, since in, uh, I'm not yet allowed to disclose the tools, uh, so the tools are in some other site that has nothing to do with me because I didn't disclose them, essentially. So they are like a Wikileaks type of thing so far. Uh, the, what's nice probably about the tools is that uh, they can be run on Linux and BSDs. If I recall correctly, THC tools can only run on Linux. Of course, you ha can have a virtual box and so on. Well, this was like, like a kind of painful job, but we ported them to at least Linux and BSDs, and uh, if I ever get access to a Mac OS box, I will try to port them to Mac OS too. Uh, conclusions. Um, essentially, if you look at IPv4 implementations, let's say more than 10 years ago, you kind of like 
find the same type of problems that we are currently finding in IPv6 implementations. So possible explanations for that. One of them is that we didn't learn the lesson from IPv4, so we are just essentially doing the same thing. Uh, another possible one is that uh, there are different people working on IPv6 than uh, there was at the time working on IPv4. So essentially the guys now doing these type of problems or introducing these problems in V6 implementations, essentially they were not doing before, 10 years ago or so. Another possible explanation is that uh, if you look at the protocol specifications, in many cases they are kind of like ambiguous. So from my perspective, they should, be, they should say more clearly how you should implement some things. And finally, the other one is that probably it's a mix of all the above. So there's work to do in the protocol specifications, different people working on them, and also because we didn't learn the lesson from, from before. There's lots of work to be done in IPv6 security in terms of everything. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do when it comes to tools, uh, scanning tools, anything you can think of. So that's one thing. Uh, there are, we need uh, lots of improvements on IPv6 implementations. From my perspective, we are in the case of v6 implementations at the same point in which we were with before, like 10, 15 years ago. So the implementations are not really mature. And um, bottom line, probably if you paid attention to the rest of the presentation, your conclusion is going to be like, I'm not going to deploy this at all. right? <laughs> But uh, the thing is that we need IPv6. Nobody deploys v6 because they love it. Uh, probably the, the best quote that I got for this was um, a guy at the conference said that IPv6 was like a shotgun marriage. I'm probably, well, they, it's like kind of like a politically incorrect thing, but the guy said that this is like a boyfriend and a girlfriend where the girlfriend gets pregnant. And, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, so the thing is that there's something to be done about it, uh, and we need IPv6, okay? Um, one of the things that I had tried to do was not to just focus on problems. It's not that discussing problems is not important, but uh, it's, we also need to do something about it. If you just tell people, uh, well, the, there, there are all these problems with v6, well, but they need to deploy v6, so what should we do about it? So the idea was to try to improve the current state of affairs. Questions? Yeah. Well, with all these problems you've shown, and possibly a lot more when, when uh, IPv6 is globally deployed, uh, how do you see this, this deployment? Are we going to have really insecure uh, networks? Or, are we, or is this going to be extremely delayed? Uh, or do you see something in the middle that most problems can be solved? quickly, because uh, for instance, uh, you talked a lot about uh, proposals for RFCs and RFCs, and, uh, and my perception is from the proposals to the RFCs and to the vendors really uh, implementing these this solutions will take some time. Yeah. Uh, the question is, do we have enough time for this to be ready for deployment or are we going to have to deploy before it's ready? I think that that depends on probably in which part of the planet you are. Uh, <laughs> for example, if you are in Asia, you are in trouble. <laughs> uh, they have already run out of addresses, they are deployed and they need V6 now, so they need to deploy whatever they have, essentially. Now in other, I think in Europe, the, I think that the, the Europe was uh, supposed to run out of V4 addresses sometime this year or next year, and that's the, 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 the central pool of addresses for Europe, and maybe well, once that address pool gets exhausted, you still have addresses in your provider for some time. Uh, I think that to a large extent that depends on the pressure that users and providers enforce on vendors. Uh, unfortunately, uh, let's say for my point of view, uh, I could just, let's say, work on the stuff, find the problems, find the tools for, for, to help vendors uh, assess their own implementations and propose solutions. But uh, my experience with vendors, no, I'm not talking about open source, that's a completely different game, but with, let's say, uh, well, a commercial vendor, if you want, is that uh, sometimes it's painful to uh, get them fix their, 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 their stuff. Uh, one thing that I found, which I don't really, I don't know if I have an explanation for that, but sometimes, for example, I had many experiences in which I went through the official channel for, um, let's say, um, reporting problems, and then that goes nowhere. 
And then at some day in some conference, you meet the actual guy that is working on the implementation. You talk with the guy and say, well, you have this one. Oh, yeah, I should fix that. And in a week, that's fixed it. <laughs> so that's like an internal communication problem, which uh, probably is, uh, has to do with those kind of vendors being so large. right? Um, I personally think that one of the biggest issues, other than that of, uh, let's say, uh, problems that have to do with uh, the, the protocol specifications, it actually have to do with the actual people that is deploying the protocols. So you may have some technology, it doesn't matter whether that's B6, B4, B8, whatever, but uh, if the personnel that is deploying that is not trained, well trained to do that, then no matter how good or bad the technology is, you are not going to have good results. And for example, one thing that you usually find is that, for example, there are guys that the same guy that is in charge of deploying B6 is in charge of this and this and this and this and that, so uh, at some point he has a deadline that in two months he needs to have B6 deployed and he does whatever he can. Um, so that's, that's a problem. Uh, I know, for example, I'm not going to say the name, but uh, there was a, a huge ISP and there were these guys from uh, the data center that for some customer they needed to deploy V6. So they go to the security staff and they ask, well, do you have any best practices for IPv6? No, okay. And, <laughs> and they just deploy whatever they could, okay? So that's a problem that, that you find. And what is going to happen, I don't know. That depends on, on the region. But my general perspective is that uh, in most cases, people is waiting for too long. And I, when I say waiting, I'm not meaning that you should deploy V6 right now. I, I'm not even talking about that. I'm not talking whether you should deploy it now, later, or whenever. But I'm arguing that you should at least have some plan for whatever a plan means. And for example, you should train yourself, even if it's just about setting up a network in a lab and just, let's say, dedicating a few hours every day to this stuff. Um, it's not that the technology is so different. But uh, as they say, it's like the devil lies in the small details. So with before, you are used to many things. Even if you look at an address, you know that if it starts with one, uh, one, uh, 192, blah, blah, it's a private address. Now, if you look at the same thing with IPv6, you don't, usually, right? And that's because you are not used to that. So we'll see. And another big problem with, uh, I'd say, with the resulting security of, of the emerging v6 deployments is that besides the personnel and besides the protocols and implementation themselves, if you look at security devices, for example, let's say that you have a B4 network running and you have an IDS and you have a firewall and so on, you know what the device can do, you know how to operate the device and so on. Now, let's say that you now want to enforce the same policy on, but on B6. Uh, in many cases, you don't have the same level of support. So if you were doing this or that other type of filtering, maybe you just cannot do it on B6 and that's up to you what you do. Uh, then there's also the case that, for example, there are some the, the, the level of support might be different, so it has the V6 firewall that you have has some level of, of V6 support, but not the same level as before. In other cases, they do the same thing, but um, for example, the device has implements the V4 support on hardware, but implements the V6 support on software. Now, depending on the type of network that you're running, that might or might not be an issue. But in some cases, uh, you buy a device which it's supposed to have V6 support, but then the performance that you get for V4 and V6 is completely different. So there's like a missing piece when it comes to security devices. Apart from how trained the personnel is, apart of how good or bad the protocols are. But you need actually actual devices that allow you to enforce security policies. And uh, that's a missing piece in most cases for, for, uh, for B6 devices. There was another question there? Uh, do you know any major incident that happened? Because uh, the last, uh, last two June, six Junes, there were IPv6 day, and, and the last one was the IPv6 launch day. And uh -huh. there, there are a lot of services that are on on IPv6, and the, some Europe EISPs that have uh, was back on their network uh -huh. already. Do you know anything? Well, I don't, but there is another related problem that in most cases, most companies don't have B6 visibility. So I don't, but the companies don't know either. So they are monitoring B4 traffic, but they don't monitor B6 traffic. So uh, it's not that I, it's, it's not only me that doesn't know, but in many cases, guys sometimes running B6 networks, they don't, they are, they don't have the same visibility of traffic as they do for, for B4. 
I do recall, uh, but that was like low level stuff. Uh, years ago, for example, there was a guy that had reported that on, on Gmail. Uh, you had a, a log of the B4 addresses from which you had connected over time, but if you connected to Gmail over B6, uh, that log wasn't there, for example. And that's a low level stuff. That's like a, I mean, you probably wouldn't care about that. But what I'm saying is that sometimes, well, you may, there are maybe subtle issues. And it's not just on the, let's say, the network stuff, but sometimes on the application. There are known cases, I don't recall off the top of my head, but for example, applications crashing because they were not prepared to handle longer addresses. So uh, that's something that we will still see. The, the, I would say that in many cases, the applications that have been, let's say, uh, port, have been ported to, to V6 are the ones that like web browsers and web servers, but there are still many that need to incorporate V6 support. For example, if you look at Skype or any of those applications, they don't have V6 support. So uh, I don't really know what's going to happen, but uh, when it comes to incidents, that's what you were asking about. Uh, there's, uh, I, I think it was Arbor Networks, they publish uh, like a kind of poll that they did for uh, to different network operators. Uh, last year, and one of the main concerns that they had was that they didn't have B6 visibility. So they were monitoring uh, B4 traffic, but they were not monitoring B6 traffic. There was also um, there was a presentation about B6 security at the conference in, in Greece this year. Uh, the slides are publicly available, and one of the things that these guys tested was they, for example, they tried to connect to port 22 of different systems, and for example, in the IPv4 case it was blocked, and in the IPv6 case it was allowed. Right? Uh, that is quite usual. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes because people may. Yeah, sometimes in some cases because maybe people just forget to do that, but in other cases it might have to do, as I said, with the so type of support that you have in your security devices. And I, I didn't discuss that on, on, on this um, presentation because it, well, it assumed like the IPv6 security basics, but. Um, one of the, let's say, major issues uh, that you have with B6 is that essentially you are running two networks at the same time, two overlapping networks at the same time. So the same device is running a B4 network and a B6 network, and you need to enforce policies and controls on, on the two of them. Uh, there's also the same thing, for example, we were talking about firewalls, and uh, for example, there are vendors, uh, firewall vendors, uh, for which uh, you need to configure the v6 policies completely in a separate way from the v4 policies. There are other vendors that are trying to integrate that. So if you say, if let's say you just want, if you filter port 22, for example, well, you just tickle the box there and they filter both v6 and v4. Uh, so that, that's a lot of work to do on the, in that area and also lots to see. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, vendors are working on uh, intrusion detection systems because uh, if I'm not wrong uh, IPsec uh, uh, it's, uh, it's as a mandatory IPsec wire over the I think short answer that I could give to that one is forget about IPsec I mean this <laughs> has been like a marketing claim for IPv6 yeah. it's going to be exactly the same about uh, uh, with IPv6 I could give you this short story that um, a couple of years ago, or one year ago, I was delayed with my report. So I should have published my report like, let's say, a couple of months ago. So I, I had like lots of alerts on Google on B6, B6 security, B6 attacks, everything. And one day I received this alert of a big report that was published. I'm not going to tell which guys, but it was like a large report. And I, well, I'm not going to say what I saw, but essentially I say I'm in trouble, let's say. I was delayed and I saw that these guys had already published like a similar thing before me. And when I look at the report, essentially it was something like 90 or 100 patients in which the guy were thinking of every possible way in which IPsec was going to be used for V6. From my perspective, you are not going to see an increased use of IPsec, for, at least for the general case. You are not going to use IPsec, well, and of course the problem is the same problem that you have in, in, in B4. Uh, in some cases it's indesirable. For example, you may not monitor the traffic, but also at the same time you have the problem that you need a PKI, you need to exchange the keys. So that might be something that is doable for a VPN or something, or for a BCP or a peering session or whatever, but it's not possible, it's not generally possible for some random communication. So my, my short answer to the IP th IPsec thing is forget about it, it's going to be the same thing as uh, IPv4. And actually, the ITF last year, 
remove the requirement of uh, IP, IPsec mandatoriness for, for B6. The reason being that nobody cared about that. So what they did was, okay, we're trying to enforce this, okay, nobody's paying attention, okay, let's change the requirement, and now everyone is compliant, right? Uh, any other question? Well, uh, if you have any questions, this is my email address. We also have a mailing list for IPv6 hacking. Uh, probably the interesting thing about the mailing list is that you have people both from the like the security community and also standards community and so on, so that's a nice mix. And so far you don't get the annoying automatic responses that you get when you post to backtrack, so that's like a feature of the, of the mailing list. So if you have any, um, any questions, feel free to, let's say, talk about or ask about the talk, ask after the talk, or, or drop me an email, okay? So, thank you.